What's up everybody, how's it going? Lately, I've been thinking a lot about the things I learned working as a software engineer at Google for a little over two years. And while there are a lot of specific engineering skills or coding techniques that I picked up over these two years, I think that there are a few high level, higher impact lessons that I've also learned during these two years. And I wanted to make a video sharing these lessons with you because I think that these lessons can be very valuable for you regardless of where you're at in your career or in your life. So with that, if you don't know the drill by now, sit back, do something productive while you watch this video, like maybe have lunch or dinner, smash the like button if you haven't already, and let's dive into the lessons. So the first lesson that I learned, and I think this is the most important one because it really applies to many aspects of life, is that no one at Google has any idea what they're doing. Let me explain. Don't get me wrong, this is not meant to be an attack on Google or on Google employees. If anything, I would argue that the sentiment that I'm giving that nobody at Google has any idea what they're doing probably applies to the people at many other big tech companies and big companies in general and companies in general, big or small. The idea is that Everybody at those companies, managers, the managers' managers, directors, the people who are really at the, the highest levels of leadership, at the end of the day, they are just human beings who found themselves in these positions probably because they had some competencies, they had some skills, but overall, they are not magicians or wizards who happen to know the future or know, you know, the answers to everything. No. And perhaps the best example that I can give to really support this argument and to, to kind of explain where I learned this lesson from, when I was an intern host, when I was hosting interns, one of my primary responsibilities was to create and scope out the project that the intern or interns were going to work on. And that responsibility was entirely in my control. And it was kind of scary because I remember realizing at one point that if I messed up, if I didn't come up with a good project, I would be sort of screwing over these interns that I had because it was all under my control. Now, of course, I had some guidance from my own manager, some support from the rest of my team, but overall, it was my responsibility and it was up to me. And I remember my manager told me this line that I remember vividly. He said, there's no adult in the other room. In other words, if you mess this up or if you, you know, don't create a good project, there's no one really there to fix it for you. Like you are the final person. And in the same vein, my manager was sort of the only adult in the room for his sort of team. And when he would make decisions for the team, he would do so using the best of his abilities, he would consult the right people, but overall, at the end of the day, it was sort of a shot in the dark. Like, there was nothing guaranteeing that his decisions were going to be the best decisions for the team. At the end of the day, he was just a human being. And again, this, this pattern applies the higher up the chain, you know, the, the organizational chain you go. Even at the higher levels of leadership, you are still dealing with human beings who have notions of how things should be done, but who don't know the exact answers to all of the problems that a business might encounter. And I think that the more you become exposed to these sort of behind the scenes conversations or higher up product decision meetings, the more you realize this, the more you realize like, wow, all of these people really don't have anything special. Again, they might be very smart, they might be very skilled, but overall, at the end of the day, when they are, for instance, suggesting a solution to a problem, they are doing so just like you and I would do so. They have just thought over a problem, used whatever expertise they have to decide if their suggested solution would be good, and then they just suggest it. Hopefully I'm not rambling too much at this point. Hopefully you can, you, you're understanding what I'm, what I'm trying to convey. I think this sort of relates back to that one famous speech by Steve Jobs uh, that he gave at the, one of the Stanford graduating classes, I forget in what year, where he said that all of the amazing products 
that you use every day or that you're surrounded by every day. All of these products and things or institutions were created by other human beings no different or not too different than you. And so all that to say that this should really be empowering. This lesson that I learned from working at Google and that I'm trying to convey to you here is that you shouldn't diminish your own thoughts and decision-making abilities in favor of other people's just because you might think, oh, this person is a director at Google, therefore they must know what they're talking about. No, the truth of the matter is they probably don't know what they're talking about that much more than you do. And another example that I just thought of right now is take me with AlgoExpert, my company. And by the way, this is a good time to plug in AlgoExpert. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out AlgoExpert.io. Use the promo code CLEM, C-L-E-M, for a discount on the platform. So lately, we've been having a lot of success with AlgoExpert. And I'm going to define success very simply just by saying that our sales and revenue numbers have been growing really fast, going through the roof. Now, with the success, I've had some people sort of put me on a pedestal, kind of saying, whoa, Clement, you must really know what you're doing. Tell me how you did it. You know, what did you do? What's the secret sauce? And the funny thing is that, yes, on the one hand, I'd like to think that I sort of know what I'm doing and that I've made some right decisions. You know, I've run the company decently. But on the other hand, at the end of the day, I don't really know what I'm doing. Like... I am trying my best. Our team is trying to make the best decisions that we can make with the information that we have. We have made some very good decisions. We have made some pretty poor decisions. A lot of these poor decisions might not be visible to our customers because they might not reach them, if that makes sense. But we've made mistakes. We've learned from our mistakes. All that to say that just because we've been doing very well lately doesn't mean that we know something that the majority of people don't. At the end of the day, we're just all in the same game trying to figure stuff out. Moving on to the second lesson that I learned while working at Google. You may have heard some people say that the biggest nightmare for a startup is to wake up one day and read in the news that Amazon or Google or some other huge company has decided to enter your market and to basically compete against you. Now, I understand why there's some merit to this fear, because at the end of the day, if you've got a big company like Amazon competing against you, they've got so many resources, so much talent, so much money that they can shove at the problem, and that is a daunting thing to face. However, and this is the second lesson that I learned, these big companies like Google or like Amazon have a certain slowness to them that is simply intrinsic to being their size. They simply cannot escape the slowness. And it makes smaller companies or startups that are much more nimble, much more fast-paced, or rather that are free to move at a fast pace, actually able to compete, if not beat, these big companies at their own game or, you know, in a certain product area. And I think that this was a really important realization because, again, it, it gave me this very sort of empowered feeling that, hey, if one day I wanted to build a startup that happens to compete against Amazon or against Google, or rather, maybe I'm working on a startup or on a project, and then down the line, a Google or an Amazon enters the space, that does not mean that it is the end of us. No, to the contrary, we might be able to beat these companies just because we're able to move much faster than them without big company chains, if that makes sense. A good example to convey this lesson is if you're working in a small startup, take Algo Expert for instance, and you get a customer that requests a feature of you and that feature happens to have merit and you want to implement it, you can implement it. You can literally implement it the very day that the customer requests it, or you can spend the next week implementing it. If you're working at a company like Google, that's likely never gonna happen that fast. Let's say you're the engineer that receives this customer request, this feature request, and you think, hey, this is pretty good. But wait, you probably have to flag it up to your manager. 
to see what they think. Would it make sense for you to suddenly shift your priorities? Would you be allowed to do that? Well, no, you probably have to bring it up to your product manager, the product manager that's responsible for your product. And they might take five days to answer your email or answer whatever communication message you sent them. And then they might have to flag it to their partner product managers. And then they might have to have a huge discussion. Oh, does this fit into our roadmap? But wait, what about privacy concerns, legal concerns? All these big sort of hoops and things that have merit when you're in a big company. Like these things are in place for a reason, but what that means is that during the time that the startup was able to implement that feature in a day or in a week, the big company wasn't able to do anything for that feature. And this is why you've got companies like Slack, for instance, the chat app that do so well, even though they have huge competitors like Google that have tons of chat apps and that I've tried time and time again to enter this space, maybe they've done decently well with some of them, but overall they haven't been able to destroy a company like Slack, in large part, at least in my opinion, because of that lack of speed that these big tech companies have and the speed that these startups have when they're growing at least. And again here, I think that this lesson was just something that was very empowering to realize because it really gives you that confidence that, hey, just because you are a small person or a small project, small team, doesn't mean that you can't build an amazing product that could compete with the likes of Google and Amazon. Those are the three lessons that I learned while working at Google. I really hope that you found them valuable. Let me know what you thought about them in the comments below. And as always, I will see you in the next video.